Well, it is Christmas time. Mariah Carey is on every radio station. And we together at Anchor Church are in a new series called Adore, where we get to come and adore Jesus. I hope that you enjoyed last week as we started this series off. Today, we're going to be talking about a vision of peace. I'm looking forward to hearing from God's word today on the peace that he offers during this holiday season. You know, as a kid, a dark memory stands out to me. I was hanging out in the living room and looked at my Christmas tree and wondered what had happened. Well, the night before, my cat had crawled up into the tree and batted away the top part of the tree. Well, for many years, we only had three quarters of a tree. That's another reason why I don't have cats today. Yet, for some reason, Christmas was full every year. The same traditions, the songs, the family time, and the focus on Jesus. Well, you might be feeling like Christmas is a little incomplete this year in 2020. But know this, if your focus is right, you can have a full Christmas. Hey, we're so glad you are joining us at Anchor Church. And we pray that today you will be blessed and that you can also respond in faith. If you make a decision, if you need prayer, if you want to go further in your relationship with God or start serving in some way at Anchor, click the icon, contact us at anchorchurch.com for your appropriate campus. And we'll get in touch with you and follow up with you. You guys have a blessed, blessed week.
Merry Christmas, Anchor. So glad that you guys are here. Uh, so glad that we get to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, as a father of a youngin, uh, I can attest that there's nothing more peaceful than a newborn sleeping. One, because it's absolutely adorable. And two, the parents actually get to sleep. But keeping that in mind, the peacefulness of a sleeping newborn, we're going to get ready to celebrate and worship our Lord and Savior with a song about when he was born and the peace that he brought to us. So go ahead and prepare yourself to worship. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Who angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds walk? great elements come to light as we look at the Christmas season. You know, we celebrate joy, we celebrate uh, Jesus' coming, and so many different elements. Uh, today, as we spend time looking at God's Word, we're looking at a vision of peace. So before we walk in that time of the sermon, as we're looking at peace, let's take a moment and let's watch this video as we rejoice in the Prince of Peace.
Did you know that over your lifetime, you will probably lock your keys in your car nine times? That's what the statistics tell us. And I don't know if you're like me, but the second I lock my keys in a vehicle, panic sets in. Triple A is on speed dial. I'm calling my wife and anyone else that might have a key to help me out. Well, sometimes life provides challenges that can attack our peace. We spoke last month about the peace of God as a gift from God, that his grace and his peace go with us. And today I want us to take a look at the manger scene, the precious little child, peaceful, the representation of Jesus as a peaceful child. And what that means for us, that Christ came to bring peace. Now, you might be looking at the manger scene and you might be thinking, is this a manger scene? Or is it two T-Rexes fighting over breakfast? Let it sit in. Make them form in your head. Oh, you see the T-Rex now, don't you? Well, this month, it's a time where we can actually turn our attention to the manger. What it means for us. The peace that God brings. So today, we're going to look at the book of Isaiah and hear from the prophet's words on a vision of peace. You know, right now, I know many are struggling with it. I was speaking with someone who recently told me that local doctors and nurses and people in the medical profession, they're really struggling right now. They're really having a hard time. And they're saying that people are coming in now more than ever for an increase in alcoholism, depression, and suicidal thoughts, that anxiety is running at its peak in our society right now. We really need a message of peace in these weary days. Matthew Henry has this to say about peace. It says, safety consists not in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. Peace that Jesus gives is not the absence of trouble, but it's rather the confidence that he is there with you always. Peace is such a precious jewel that I would give anything for it but truth. Matthew Henry hits it right on the head. The world has many troubles and we will face those troubles head on, but we can be certain that God's peace can go with us. Uh, that's why I believe it's Put this way in John 16, 33, Jesus said, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation or troubles, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Let's look together now at the prophecy found in the book of Isaiah about Jesus being the Prince of Peace. Jesus being the one with all authority to be able to declare that in Him is true peace. When you follow the light and you follow the Lord, it will lead you to His peace. In Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, we see here some prophetic words that are dealing with current situations as well as a future hope. In verse 1 it says, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into the contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the later time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee, of the nations. See, the time of gloom that he's, he's referring to here, it refers to the, the northern kingdom. And remember, as we talked last week about them wanting to attack King Ahaz, and Ahaz refused a sign from the Lord, but he says, I'm going to give a miraculous sign anyway that there's hope in Christ. Well, in this passage here, 
it's referring to the gloom of the northern tribes uniting together to attack Judah in, in opposition against Judah. And, and by this time in 70, uh, 732 BC, we see that Assyria has come to rule over the northern kingdom. And so the northern kingdom, the Assyrians, there is great gloom that lurks with uh, an impending war and, and the thought of war coming their way. It's interesting to note that that's where Christ spent most of his ministry. He spent it near the Sea of Galilee in those regions in the northern kingdom. And Isaiah is describing this as a time of gloom coming to an end. That the former things in verse 1, that he's brought to contempt in these lands in the northern areas. But in later times, he has made a glorious way. And he is going to set them on a course that will lead them to true peace. In verse 2 of Isaiah, it says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. They've seen a great light. The light leads us to peace. The light is a vision of peace. And with the coming of Christ, Isaiah is also prophesying that there will be no eternal gloom for those who are in Jesus Christ. There will be a transferring from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. When you follow the light, when you follow the Lord, he leads you out of darkness and into light. And it's the light that illuminates our path to true peace. If you Google peace, you YouTube peace, you're going to find that that space is dominated by alternative thinking. That many of the hits that are coming up online, they're not leading people to true peace. They're searching for inner peace and they're trying to find peace through transcendental meditation, through Buddhism. But in Christ, there is true peace. Peace. The light of the Lord leads us to peace because it leads us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, it says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his saints in light. And he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I like the way Pastor Justin of Anchor South puts it, and he says this. He says that peace is found in the kingdom of God. Which kingdom do you belong to? Do you belong to a kingdom of darkness that's ruled by tension, that has no peace, or are you a part of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light that leads us to true peace? In Matthew chapter 4, verses 15 through 16, it recounts this picture in Isaiah chapter 9. It says, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, on them, a light has dawned. With the coming of Christ as a peaceful child, yes, there was a light that shone to lead us to peace. And as the wise men followed that star, followed that light, still today, wise men and women follow the light of God to find peace. See, the light of God leads us to the peace of God. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 3, it says, You have multiplied the nation, and you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of the oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. 
For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle, tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For as to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. See, God the Father will lead the people from spiritual darkness and into light by sending his child, as we see in verse 6, who will be the Messiah that we see in, right there in verse 6. That child that verse 2 describes will come as Savior, as we see in verse 6. And when you find Christ, it unlocks life into abundant living. It really does. It unlocks life into true peace and joy. Did you catch what it says there in Isaiah 9? It says that our joy will increase at the harvest and during the spoils of war. In the times of victory and harvest, the joy increases. Our joy meter goes up. You see, as joy goes up, peace is the foundation. When our joy meter is low, we're usually not at peace. But when we have followed the light of God to discover his peace that he gives that's found in him, it increases our joy in life. In Christ, the highest highs become even higher and the joys become more joyful. The peace of God is what intensifies joy in our lives. That should speak to us. That should challenge us. That should set a new standard for what we ought to attain. We should be crying out prayers to God that Paul wrote in Ephesians, asking him to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever imagine. We should be asking for the same kind of prayers that the epistles and the New Testament speak of about finding true satisfaction in God. And that even in trials, as James speaks of, we can count it all joy. That the lowest of lows, we can still be joyful. And the highest of highs, our joy can increase. It can be intensified. We get a joy because of the peace of God that the world that is still in the kingdom of darkness cannot attain to. They must cross over from darkness to light and follow the light to find true peace that will intensify our joy. And that's found in the Messiah. And Isaiah prophesies about it. And he says six things about this coming Messiah. The first thing that we see is that he's going to come as a child. What a humble and lowly appearance to come as the king, savior of the world. Our king came as a humble and perfect portrait of a saving God, lowering himself from the throne room of heaven, taking on the nature of Man in humility, not counting his equality with God a thing to be grasped, but lowered himself so that he could genuinely be our perfect sacrifice. He came as a child. In verse 2, it says the government, or the second thing I want you to see here in this passage is that the government will be on his shoulders. That's what we see from the prophet Zechariah in chapter 14, verse 9, and it says, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one in his name, one. Zechariah confirms the prophecy here of Isaiah. They confirm each other. 
all promoting a, a king that goes beyond an earthly kingdom and now into a heavenly kingdom that we get to join in moving from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. It says that he is a wonderful counselor. Have you ever received counsel that you didn't feel was wonderful? You just kind of want to run and do the opposite. But this wonderful counselor will come to us and alongside of us and, and give us good counsel, wise counsel, biblical counsel to lead us down the right path. The everlasting father this is an idiom used to describe the Messiah's relationship with time. It's not calling the Son the Father. However, John 1 clearly states that Jesus is God. We see all throughout Scripture that when he says, I and the Father are one, that that is truth. But this is an idiom that was used to describe the future Messiah's relationship with time, everlasting Father, that his relationship with time endures from before time to after time here on earth. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And finally, what we see here is that he is the Prince of Peace. And he can give you peace here on earth, but this peace, peace stretches far beyond it. This peace, peace talks about a prophecy of a king that's going to come and rule here on earth and establish his, his rule during the millennial reign and for all of eternity. See, Matthew Henry also says this about peace. He says, when Christ left this world, he left his soul to the Father, his body to Joseph of Arimathea, and his clothes to the soldiers, his mother to the care of John. But his disciples, he left his peace the peace of God, to dwell with man. Christ makes a way for us to be at peace with God and experience his true peace. In Christ, peace is found. In John 14, 27, it says this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives it, do I give it to you. But let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. You're going to face opposition, trials, and difficulties in life. And you might find yourself in a moment where you're grasping for the peace of God and you're reaching out for it and you don't, you don't feel it. But we have the promise from the Son of God that if we ask for His peace, it will be granted to us that his peace is found in him. When our eyes are on the circumstance and we're searching for a solution, we're not going to have the peace of God. We might have a peace that the world could provide, but when our eyes move away from the circumstance, they move away from looking for a solution and to the solution, we have God's peace. And as we've said today, this is only available for those who are followers of Jesus. If you don't know Christ, there's a couple passages that I want you to look at with me today. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. First, you must have peace with God. And that only comes through being justified by God through faith in Christ. See, our faith in Jesus and the grace of God given to us by the Lord is what leads us to be justified in our actions. Not our work, our merit, or what we've done on the good side of Santa's list that he's been checking twice. No, that can't purchase righteousness. That righteousness is found in Christ. And it's our faith in Jesus and the gift of God's grace that saves us. And then it justifies us. It makes it just as if I never had sinned. However, I have sinned and I will sin in the future. But Christ wipes that slate clean. He forgives our debt, the payment that we owe towards God because of our sin, which is spiritual death. The wrath of God was poured out on Christ. He paid that for us, therefore justifying us. We see that in Romans 5, 8. 
But God showed us his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So you pair these two verses, verse 1 and 8 together, we find that because of Christ and his death and resurrection, we can have the peace of God. We're no longer at war with God over our sin. We don't have to pay God anything. There's no payment due to God for our sin because Christ has paid it. And then Romans 5.10 says, For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. One who is at peace with God will receive the peace of God. So if you you have never experienced the peace of God that intensifies joy in your life, maybe today's the day that you confess that you, you have a vision for peace, you hope for peace, but you've been trying to find it in the world and it hasn't satisfied. And, and now you must find it in Christ and accept his death and resurrection on your behalf as the payment for your sin. W- would you give your life to Christ right now? Just right now, where you are, watching, listening, online, would you confess your need of God, admit your sin to him, Ask that he'd forgive you and fill you with his Holy Spirit. Would you believe that he really is who he says he was, the Son of God? And would you ask him for his peace right now? He'll give it to you. God can make peace with you, an enemy, and now call you a friend and a part of his family. If you're already a follower of Jesus and you've been really wrestling and struggling with peace in this season, I would ask you to do something very simple. Turn your eyes back to the light. Look upon the Savior. And as 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Would you do that now? Would you just openly and honestly talk to the Father? Share your struggle. Tell him what's robbing you of your peace right now and ask him to show up and fill you with his peace so that you can feel the highest highs in life. Your joy may be intensified and even in your lowest lows, you can still be at peace because you know that God is in control and he's making a way and he has a plan and his ways are not your ways, but you trust them. Would you turn to God in prayer? The next thing that I want you to do is turn to the word of God. Look into the word of God. Ask God to lead you to a passage or a scripture. or Get online and research whatever it is that's robbing you of your peace. And look for scriptures that can match that. And let the word of God fall fall fresh on you. Because there really is no better way to be at peace than to hear from the word of God. The next thing I want you to do, I really want you to do these three very simple tasks. I want you to turn the dial, change the radio station. I know Air One might be doing a pledge drive right now, so go check out, you know, K-Love or something, or get on a Spotify playlist or Apple playlist for worship music. And I want you to change the dial. Turn off whatever it is in this world, the music or the movies that you're watching and listening to, the pressures of your life, and I want you to change the channel. Fill your mind and your heart with expressions of praise. Turn the dial to begin praising God and listening to and singing songs that are focused on Him. I promise you that whatever you're going through, If you do those three things, casting your care on him, hearing from his word, and then praising him, you will see the shift happen. And the circumstance might not go away. The difficulty might not go away. But God will provide you a sense of peace. Father, we ask for your peace. In these troubling days, we believe your word that says in you is peace. 
We believe you when you say in this world, we're going to face troubles and trials and difficulties, but we can take heart because you have overcome the world. We can trust you and you will provide us your peace. And when we follow the light to your peace, we will intensify the joy in our lives here on this earth because you will have done that work in our hearts in aligning us with your will and your way. And we can have great confidence in following that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Merry Christmas. Thanks for joining us.